All right, so this looks like an advertisement. I left this here a long time ago because it feels like I've been drinking sand. Mm. Monster, it's outside that door. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> it was a great introduction, and it's really nice to have those accolades laid out because it's something that maybe you think about a little bit about yourself. Hopefully, if you have acquired a lot of accolades as a strength coach, as an athlete, as a human being, that you don't wear them on the back of your shirt everywhere you go. I hope that's not the case with most people. I know for some, it's a difficult challenge. So when I hear it for myself, although it does strike me with a little bit of pride, when I hear it said out loud to a group of people, some of which I've never met, it's also extremely humbling to me because it makes me realize that what I'm going to present today and the information that I've presented in the last four summer strongs is an accumulation of the experiences that I've had. Hello? This, hello? Can you hear me now? Yeah. You can grab that if you want. I, I'm, I'm not going to be offended. The first speech of every conference, there's always a little bit of a transition period as technology kind of fires down and gets muted. I had to do it for my own before I got up here. In the past presentations, I've always initiated by saying that when I present, although it's something I enjoy to do, you'll notice that very rarely will I make eye contact with the crowd. So don't take it personally if I'm staring at your feet. It's just how I think and how I work. Over the last four Summer Strongs, I've had the pleasure and opportunity to speak about goal setting, planning, and how to motivate athletes and motivate yourself to be successful. And it's something I care very much about, and I'm glad I've gotten to speak on it so many times to so many people. But when the opportunity came up this year to speak, it was a carryover from last year and the opportunity that unfortunately we didn't have due to the nature of the world that we live in right now. But I had an idea. And the idea was presented to me after a conversation I had with John Wellborn from Power Athlete. He said, I love your presentations, but give us actionable plan, right? How do we leave a two-day seminar and actually have things to take with us that when I I can implement it into my life? And it was a really good point because I can talk to you about the theory and principles that I used for goal setting to get me from a really small town in the middle of nowhere to success at the end of the day, but that was an actionable plan for me, right? It was something that I did. So then I sat down and I thought about it and I reached out to Bert and I said, you know, in a past life of athletics, one of the things I was most passionate about as a coach was trying to implement things into my training and into my life that could give me that edge over my competitors. For me, I was fascinated with sports supplementation. I was fascinated with the idea of upregulating the effects that things that we could use, consume, or buy that could give me a benefit on the day that I played sports. And so this year, the thing that I'm going to speak about is something I used to present when I traveled a lot around the world for a company called Polyquin Performance. Back in those days, what I spoke on and what I typically would lecture on was the optimization of human performance through sports nutrition. Okay. Now, when we talk about sports nutrition, I'm not talking about using a massive dietary plan to offset the negligence of an American diet or a Western lifestyle. Sports supplementation in its purest form is how do I make athlete A better than athlete B? I'm not focused, and please don't take this the wrong way. I'm not focused about long-term health and welfare. Now, when I say that, it's not because we're doing things that are dangerous, it's because taking caffeine to train that day is not something that you talk about in terms of whether or not it's going to be a lifestyle change. It's a stimulant, right? And there are things that we can incorporate nutritionally, usually through supplementation, that when we use them correctly, not only do they improve how our brain perceives and and collects data, but it also changes how our energy, personality, and well-being interpret the information and then apply our physical to it, if that makes sense. So I thought I'd keep it really to the point this year, and I'll give you actionable plans that you can take with you, things that I've worked on over the years to try to upregulate human performance in my athletes, some of which, for sure, 
will be things that you have seen before or are currently utilizing. But we're going to break it down in a way where I'll introduce a handful of things and why we use them in sports and why they were so beneficial when we integrated them. Does that sound like a plan? Yep. Awesome. Yep. All right. So when we break down sports nutrition, okay, and the way that we used to break it down with our Olympic athletes and high performers of any world. Now, we understand that in the world of nootropics and the ever-changing landscape of people making money on the internet, we talk about things that are, how does it make a person a, a more of a go-getter? How does it make that person more focused in the boardroom? How does it make that person be able to basically limitless themselves like Bradley Cooper? Well, the reality is, is when you get back to the basics of sports performance nutrition, you have pre, intra, and post nutrition. That's the window we're going to talk about in this lecture. We're not going to talk about what you do from Monday to Friday, what your meal plan is. Was it five meals, six meals? Was it intermittent fasting? Did you not eat for 16 hours to upregulate fatty acid oxidization? That's a completely different mindset. It's more complex at times, and it's much more demanding on the athlete to get right. This, or th and this topic, this is an area that we can immediately affect an athlete even if they live on fast food and they live on things that aren't so great. I could even make the argument that your athletes that have a tendency to have really poor nutritional habits will benefit the greatest from optimization of the pre, intra, and post-workout window. Does that make sense? So the person that isn't really doing it well will benefit the most on game day or sport day when you utilize things that are probably missing from their diet. When we look at pre-workout, the big ones that we look at is we look at in terms of neurological, things going on inside the head that relate to the mechanics of movement, the ability to signal or send a message. Right? From there, we look at muscle drive, the ability to initiate the activity that the neurological or central nervous system is trying to communicate. And then the last one that we look at in the focus of activation is metabolic drive. The ability to complete the activity, if it's not the hammer throw, which I competed in, right? So I played a three-second sport, Bert played a three-second sport, right? So in those worlds, what ends up happening is everything typically is the neural and the muscle, the metabolic not so much, right? But if you play a sport, like maybe we have a triathlete, Maybe we have a wrestler, we have an athlete with duration activity. In those situations, there's always going to be the metabolic drive component, the ability for sustained activity as it relates to how their brain interprets the information, their muscles perform the action, and their energy system completes it time and time and time again. So when I break down the first focus, the supplements that we're going to look at today, and I say supplement, but what we're really talking about is different nutrients. You know, supplement is such a, a gray word because it makes it sound like there's money involved, but it's not, okay? Protein is a supplement, but protein is protein. We're going to look at acetyl-L-carnitine, tyrosine, and caffeine as the first three in this section for neurological, okay? For the muscle drive section, we're going to look at carnitine and creatine. Creatine's an interesting one, we're going to get into it because it's been around forever. People don't realize it has more benefits than what EAS sold us in the late 90s. <laughs> right. Metabolic drive will be beta alanine, phosph <coughs> phosphatidylcholine, and CoQ10 and biquinol. Okay? CoQ10 is also another one that we think is for old people, right? They're starting to age. They start taking this to protect their heart. Reality is, for a metabolic athlete, if they're not taking it, they're leaving a lot of performance on the table. Focus two or intra, right, is something that uh, a former uh, mentor or coach of mine, Charles Poliquin and Judd Logan talked a lot about. It's the ability to give nutrient to the body that sustains the activity. Now on products like Onnit that you'll see in the alpha brain, it will often fall under the category of flow state, right? We always hear the conversation. Flow state is the ability to get to a certain wavelength in which exercise and stress on the body is not perceived as difficult as it is, and the hard, fast, dynamic movements that we do become very autonomic, right? The ability to play a sport at the Olympic level without thought, 
a selflessness, a third person to watch a UFC fight from the sky even though you're the one throwing the punches. You hear these things. All of that falls under the intra of a training session. You get the body ready. The intra is the actual competitive activity. This is probably the section that is most interesting and most curious because there's things that can affect it dramatically. In this case, we're going to look at ginkgo, phospholocerine, and bacopa. Things that, once again, seem very uninspiring because they've been around forever, right? Ayurvedic medicine, bacopa has been around for 5,000 years. The ginkgo biloba tree, when they've found it in the wild, sometimes it's 1,500 years old. When European settlers discovered ginkgo biloba, they discovered it at a Japanese monastery in 1690. It was growing wild on the steppes. But yet, when you take those supplements from a reputable source and you integrate them into your competitive world, you actually get a tremendous benefit. And I will talk about long-term benefits of this as well. Then there's the metabolic or completion aspect or energy system. We're going to look at beta-alanine, alcitrulline, essential amino acids, branched-chain amino acids, and the B6 is a representation for the mistake that most people make when they take one and not the other. We'll talk about that as well, okay? And so that, oops, sorry, it's sensitive. All right, and we're gonna have some quotes in here. And these are quotes that I thought of as I was putting this presentation together. The first one, a well-trained athlete can eccentrically lower roughly 150% of their concentric maximum. Well, lowering the weight eccentrically, the body typically activates one half of the motor units that it does during concentric activation. If you're to think of weightlifting in its truest form for somebody that does it well, the growth and change of a tissue should be called weight lowering. Just something to think about. All right, so let's break this down. Focus one, activation. So when we start to look at how we deal with sports supplementation, we look at how we take different things and whether or not it's going to dramatically affect our thought process, our perception of things, and then we look at whether or not it's going to have a carryover to energy. Not every supplement that is of good nature has a sensation to it, <laughs> right? So when you look at neurodrive and you look at acetylcarnitine, tyrosine, and caffeine, which are three dominant nutrients that are in most pre-workout supplementation in the nootropic world, what you're looking at is supplements that are going to have a direct effect on the psychology of the person that's getting ready to perform. And when I say the, the, the psychology, what we're typically looking at when we integrate this type of supplementation is an increase at catecholamines, in particular dopamine and norepinephrine and adrenaline. We want to bring up those things in the body through increasing neuroceptors, increased in the neurological reaction so that the desire to do a thing increases. Think of it this way, dopamine, which we hear so much about, dopamine hits, oh, that was, man, it just hit different. It's like, that's, they're talking about dopamine. Whenever that phrase is used, it's, it's a reward, an anticipation of success. It's, a, it's an idea that what you're going to get is a better life for a thing. Dopamine is the trigger. If we go back biologically in time, think of it as this way. Think of it as cortisol, the stress hormone, gets you up in the morning to go hunting because you're hungry. Dopamine is the reward chemical for having killed the animal. Does that make sense? So the dopamine gets fed from the achievement of the task in which cortisol, the stress hormone, created and made you get up and go for. So cortisol gets us up in the morning, if that makes sense. People always think of cortisol as a bad thing, and in terms of sports, we want to mediate it a little bit, but cortisol is what keeps you alive. Cortisol wakes you up and gets you going. So people that have high cortisol at night as a tangent, that's a problem. You want to have high cortisol in the morning, and you want to have high cortisol when you start doing aggressive training. It triggers the body 
to do the thing in which it feels it has to for survival, and dopamine rewards you. Oh. <laughs> Ta da! <laughs> right? Now, when we look at tyrosine, acetyl L carnitine, and caffeine in particular, they are triggering the production of these chemicals, these neurological driving forces, all three of which have been linked to or associated with the clarity and, and focus of the mind. Tyrosine in particular is a relatively easy thing to come across outside of the supplementation world. Oh, somebody's leaning against the light switch. <laughs> All right, we're good. So tyrosine, you know, Latin word tyro is from cheese, right, or, or dairy, right? So it's easy to get in the system. Acetyl-L-carnitine and tyrosine combined, when you use them in a supplementation form, is something that you want to take in the morning, the days that you train in preparation so that you have the neurotransmitters to be successful. Caffeine we get so much of, for the most part, in coffee, way more than we need, way more than anyone can probably tolerate, but it's become an addictive drug because what it has a tendency to do, both in literature and reality, is create clarity of mind, an increased rate of acknowledgement in terms of memory and task creation, right? So caffeine, for example, is a, is a psychomotor stimulant right, if you don't take too much. Psychomotor stimulant out of the four categories, you know, you have psychomotor, you have memory, you have visual acuity, you have executive decision making, right? Visual acuity falls under the third category and we're gonna look at psychomotor. Psychomotor, when you think of it, is like hand-eye coordination, the ability to shoot a gun or throw a dart, in those motions, if you take caffeine but not too much, it will actually improve all of those things. Caffeine also will improve motor category. It is one of the three in the pre-supplementation world where in which you will have some sort of physical stimulation from it. Some people are sensitive to it because their liver doesn't oxidize caffeine the way other people do. So who remembers when caffeine was a banned supplement at the IOC level and NCAAs, for example? I mean, there's a few of us a little bit older. The reason that was is because they knew it was a stimulant, and if you took a bunch of Vivran or yellow tabs before you competed, <laughs> yeah, no, there's a few of us in here that rode that dog hard. <laughs> That's right. so, so if you take that Vivran and it gives you that stimulation, they used to pop you on a drug test. But then what they used to, or what they did find out is that certain genetic types don't metabolize caffeine the same through their liver. So as the world's desire for Starbucks, et cetera, increased, the rate in which people were getting elevated caffeine levels just in their everyday life became so high that they realized they had to remove it from the banned supplement list, right? So there's some stuff like caffeine where it, it was kind of demonized, but it, it really is very successful. Paul Quinn and his Olympic athletes discovered that if you took caffeine away from an athlete, and cleaned out their receptor sites for caffeine, they could see a two to 4% increase in maximal strength on meat day and power sports if they were caffeine deprived leading into the event. That's significant. If you take athletes that are metabolically based like triathletes or marathoners, it will blunt or decrease the sensation of perceived pain over time. So caffeine changes the way in which the brain neurologically tolerates the stress of an event. Tyrosine increases focus by increasing, increasing vascular blood flow to the brain, right? Acetyl-L-carnitine allows carnitine and fatty acid oxidization to occur more efficiently, and acetyl-L-carnitine allows for it to cross the blood-brain barrier. So when we look at neurodrive, those things are affecting the mind. When we jump down to muscle drive, we look at creatine, we look at phospholocholine. We know conclusively that if you can increase the pool of choline in the body, right, lecithin is a good example of phospholocholine, right, supplement, lecithin, soy lecithin. When you increase choline, we know that the number one depleter of the choline pool is intense 
physical exercise over duration. We know that choline allows for the transport of the neurological signal for muscle contraction. So if our choline levels are depleting during extended metabolic work, by default, we are losing a percentage of human performance. It's a very easy supplement to supplement. When you increase choline pool in an athlete leading up to an event over three to four weeks, they measure that choline pools will stay above average during extended duration performance up to two hours. So it affects even up to marathon length and then you replenish, okay? Creatine, which now has kind of become like this thing that no one talks about, creatine monohydrate was discovered by a French scientist in the 1800s. It was separated and actually formulated into a consumable product while they were still riding horse and carriage. Creatine monohydrate then was not used for athletic performance until the 1970s by the former DDR and the Russian sports agencies. From there, it finally started to gain some traction, but it was still expensive because no one was manufacturing it. And then it became phosphagen in the 1990s under labels like EAS that made a fortune, but people overconsumed it. And they overconsumed it because they discovered that if you massively upregulate a consumption of creatine monohydrate, you created cellular hydro, uh, cellular hydro hypertrophy, right? So what that means is you get a momentary increase in the muscle cell size because you filled it with water like a balloon, like you just swelled it up. Now, where would that be a positive? Well, we're a hydraulic animal when we lift weights. Right? So if we can create more intercellular tension in the tissue by filling it with water, like people do with anabolics, right? Water retention. Creatine was creating the same scenario. And so what was happening is as the cell fills with water, they can handle more load in a very expedited state of existence, and they would tear a muscle or get injured. So creatine started to get a very terrible reputation because it was creating a scenario in which athletes were getting too strong too quickly and blowing up. Does that make sense? And so a lot of the good literature on creatine monohydrate got shelved because people didn't want to use it. The NCAAs banned it, right? But what they didn't realize is creatine monohydrate, when incorporated into a nutritional protocol in a manner in which it didn't cause massive cellular retention and or GI distress, right? That's the big one. Everyone's like, ah, oh, guy was on creatine monohydrate, he got dehydrated, had a heat stroke. Hmm, might wanna look down that rabbit hole just a touch further because what you'll realize is any product that you put in that granular form, and back then it was usually very pure, unpurified variations of creatine monohydrate will cause gastro distress. If I go in the back and just eat a, like, a scoop of coffee grounds, I'm going to have gastro distress, right? Because my body's like, what's this? I don't know, but let's call the fire department. We're going to wash this out, you know? <laughs> right? So, so that's what happened. And so a lot of people were dehydrated, but they weren't dehydrated because the creatine was causing the side effect of dehydration, the actual overconsumption to get swole. To be jacked and strong was the side effect causing dehydration. Now we reverse that back a little bit. If you took a maintenance dose of creatine monohydrate every single day, the things we know conclusively now, all these years later, I mean only 221 years later since they created it, ah, the French, they were ahead on that one. I'm give them, yeah is what we understand is not only is creatine monohydrate heat resistant, it protects the brain from overheating and heat stroke. It does the exact opposite thing they said people were dying from, oddly enough. Now the problem is, is no one ever rewrites literature at the corporate level, and so what happens is it'll probably still stay banned for the most part. The other thing that creatine needs to be considered for, and the science is strong, when somebody experiences a TBI, so there's first stage, second stage. First stage is you know moments, days, and weeks, Second stage is the mitochondria's ability to send a signal along the neurological lines to reestablish brain function. 
Creatine monohydrate in a clinical setting has been shown to speed up the rate in which speech, hearing, and motor skills improve during second stage TBIs. So if you have an athlete, I don't care if they're a tested athlete because you'll never test positive, I don't work in that world, so I don't care. If you have someone with a TBI and you don't put them on creatine monohydrate, you're slowing down their progress back to a healthy state of existence. The science is pure. I don't care if whatever governing body isn't in that science world. That's just a fact. So if you're working outside of that world where it's not an issue, maybe military, for example, and you have athletes with TBIs or race car drivers or UFC, and you're not using daily dose creatine that is non-stomach distressing, you're missing out on the recovery and healing effects of the supplement. It's a big one, okay? And then metabolic drive, we've got beta alanine, CoQ10, and Biquinol. Um, and Biquinol is non-oxidized variation, and Biquinon is the oxidized. So Biquinol is the one you always want to look for. And L-carnitine. All right, these are a couple of my favorites. Here's why. Beta alanine, when it first discovered in the sports supplementation world, was back in 2006. Back then, people didn't really know what to do with it. So they started testing it, and this is, like, this is why strength and conditioning is so amazing, and why if you just say yes to a bunch of shit, life just throws opportunity on your lap. I, I, I was coaching at a small D2 in Adam State, Southern Colorado. Supplementation rules were all over the road back then. You know, they just kind of dropped the hammer on a few things, but new stuff would come and go. And the wrestling coach comes in one day and he's like, hey, I put my wrestlers into this study. I'm like, what's a study? And he's like, it's beta alanine. Have you ever heard of it? I'm like, not a clue, right? So I immediately went home and looked at beta alanine on, you know, the equivalent of like the internet. It was still kind of archaic. You know, to be honest, it was actually just factual, right? So in 2006, when I looked up beta alanine, they're like, it is a derivative of carnosine. I was like, oh, shit, I got the real information. Now if I go look up, it's like this giant ad for just being awesome, right? You have no idea what the supplement does. <laughs> so beta alanine was an interesting one. When they started incorporating beta alanine into metabolic, it, through the carnosine pass pathway, was a buffer of lactate. Right? So basically, over a course of two to four weeks of consuming small dose beta alanine, you would build up the, the tolerance to overcome lactate threshold. Right? So basically, your RPE would be different than your body's actually producing. And I'll give you a couple examples. So these wrestlers started using beta alanine, and they did it for about 12 weeks. And what they noticed is their work capacity in a real world setting increased dramatically. They were able to tolerate longer, harder sessions on the mat without as much perceived discomfort. I thought that was pretty interesting. So we started to give it to our 400 meter runners. And what we discovered with our 400 meter runners when we were training at that time is everyone knows what the wall is in the 400, right? It, it's, you can look at it as time, you can look at it as distance. Everyone's like, ah, the wall's about 300 meters, right? You know, and they're like, Whatever that is, like, you know, 39 seconds for this guy or, you know, 15 seconds for me, I hit the wall, right? So it just, <laughs> you know, it just depends what's happening. So say an athlete was hitting the wall like 300 meters, which for me would be about four and a half minutes, right? <laughs> yeah, I got a pretty good metabolic threshold. Um, yeah, anyways. So... I digress. So when you look at getting an athlete around the track and they're hitting that wall, when you gave them beta alanine, the wall got further, if that makes sense. So they went from hitting the wall at 280, 300, 340, and then eventually you just get so much lactate production that the athlete starts to have those effects. But what we were able to do is to push that window further. Now, the reason why beta alanine gets dumped on so hard is because this used to be during human performance era of social media. This wasn't during the, the glam shot, overhead lighting, look a certain way, go to a gym and master a, a fundamental era. And it's not a bad thing. You just have to differentiate where the information is going. So during this era, what was the downside of beta alanine? You didn't feel it other than the tingly if you took too much. 
But there was no perceived performance increase like creatine, its big brother, had been getting up to this point. And so what happened is people were like, nah, I don't really like it. Because the problem that we found with beta alanine is it took two to four weeks to see the maximum effect. You had to actually improve that entire system and create an abundance. The positive with beta alanine is when we ceased taking beta alanine, the effects lasted for two to four weeks, right? So it's actually a really good product for metabolic performance. And it did the lactate buffering that everyone was trying to do with baking soda or whatever it was up to that point, right? You know, and people, people just blowing it out, you know, badly with baking soda because it was so hard on the stomach. This was not. Then we moved into looking at something which up there is the CoQ10. Now this is a supplement a lot of people look at in terms of how it affects older people that are aging because it is so cardioprotective. So cardioprotective. Dude, I am actually doing that. I am turning them on. I'm like, like, when I paused, the lights went off, and then I'm like, whoop, and there they were. That's 100% a part of the show. So, so when we look at CoQ10 in terms of being cardioprotective, then what they started to look at is what is one of the big features of metabolic high performance, CrossFit's a great example of this, uh, Rudy's world was a great example of this, not only the martial arts, but also the tactical world where they're having to get out and go, life and death go, no, no bullshit, right? You gotta have dependable system. So when you look at all of these things, what they discovered is not only is CoQ10 an incredible antioxidant, and not only does it do an amazing job at negating the incredible stresses of cortisol on the body, but it actually upregulates the efficiency of the mitochondria, the energy house of our body, the thing in which gives us the energy to be successful people. A lot of people that have depleted or tired mitochondrial systems, right, and you'll never not have one, right, it's the energy transfer powerhouse, but when that gets wore out from a lot of stress, you start to get a lot of secondary effect fatigue, adrenal fatigue, right? Some of these things that were buzz terms back in the day. CoQ10 can upregulate that. What they found, especially with athletes that were big metabolic work athletes, 300 milligrams, hey, can I have one of those? Yeah, so 300 milligrams a day over a couple weeks will massively increase the athlete's ability to tolerate metabolic work. Right? And so with that being said, when you take CoQ10, not only is it really good for the heart and lungs, but it's amazing for human performance and endurance. What? Yeah, it was. I'll tell you, man, if you're going, I'm coming. I'm going. Right? And so that is the key to that intra-phase to get things rolling. The next phase, once we get into that, the flow state, when we break down ginkgo biloba, which I said was a 1,500-year-old tree discovered in a monastery in the 1600s, ginkgo biloba in particular for athletes, neurologically as well as athletes that have to have incredible focus in the, in the ability to tolerate executive function things, high risk to reward decision making, Ginkgo paloba increases blood flow to the cerebral cortex, and not only that, but ginkgo decreases cellular hypoxia of the brain. Ginkgo biloba doesn't get nearly enough attention. People talk about it for aging adults because of Alzheimer's and memory loss. Taking ginkgo biloba daily as an athlete will allow the athlete's memory to improve so that they can tolerate data and make quicker, more precise decisions with the information that they're given. Ginkgo biloba, highly, highly undervalued. Ginkgo is so simple and so easy to get, and it's such a clean supplement. When you get these supplements from like a real reputable source, I mean, we have one here. Thorne has a giant silver trailer on the grass that's medical grade supplementation that will increase human performance. If you want to talk to the brightest guys in the room on this subject, grab them. You will not be disappointed. If they disagree with anything that I say, I deny it completely. <laughs> Phosphatidylserine, in terms of the phospholytyl groups, is a brain active. 
Phospholysterine, the reason why it's in all these pre-workout supplements and nootropics is again, it increases blood flow to the brain. It increases the rate in which our brain, imagine a muscle with no blood flow, right? It's the same thing. You wanna increase memory, focus, neurological drive, the ability to get choline to the muscle, you have to have a healthy blood flow to the brain. And Bacopa, 5,000 year old tree, right? Bacopa, the thing that made it most interesting when people started to look at it was the fact that it had a dramatic effect to decrease what appeared to be the effects of dementia or late, on, uh, late stage Alzheimer's. So there's a healthy benefit to Bacopa and Ginkgo. You give your brain blood, it doesn't oxidize from the stress of life, and it has a better fighting chance, okay? And the metabolic, beta-alanine, which we talked about, essential amino acids, branched-chain amino acids. So up until about six years ago, BCAAs was the end-all, be-all to put it on muscle mass, right? If you could take BCAAs during a workout, you were giving yourself the ability to delay catabolic breakdown for the sake of typically hypertrophy or muscle gain. Then they realized that all these people were taking 30 grams of BCAAs a workout. It was pretty common probably through 2010 to 2014. What ended up happening with those athletes is they started to develop massive vitamin B deficiencies because they didn't have the reserve of B vitamins to deal with the onslaught of increased branched chain amino acids. So people kind of took a step back, you know, and how many people flushed a shitload of money down the toilet just crushing BCAAs and they're like, wow, maybe we should use a more generalized approach that has a little more balance to it. Well, how do we do that? I don't know, let's use essential amino acids as well and make it a complete meal. So whenever I look at intra-workout nutrition for the sake of cellular hypertrophy, if you're trying to get as jacked as possible, you have to have intra-workout nutrition. You have to. You're missing out on an entire window of massive upregulation. Now, people will say, yeah, but you're in a, a sympathetic state, so you're not in rest and digest, so you're not going to have upregulation. And eh, nothing's ever that black and white, you know what I mean? You flip that light on or flip it off, it's not clean. So when you inject nutrient into the body, some of it will get into the bloodstream, some of it will delay the effect of the stress that you're under and blunt the effect of cortisol. Cortisol gets you up in the morning, but it deteriorates muscle mass, right? <laughs> okay, so you want to make sure that you're in the most anabolic window possible. And the reason I use L-citrulline, and L-citrulline is an alpha amino acid that is not from a protein source. Who knows where citrulline's from, L-citrulline? Just, watermelon. yes sir, watermelon, right? So L-citrulline, it scavenges the citric oxide and increases NO. So the same reason someone would take L-arginine to get a pump when they train, L-citrulline does it as well, but it does it in a manner in which seems to be more efficient. So L-arginine is efficient at increasing NO production. That's why it's in Viagra, right? So with that being said, L-citrulline, when taken supplementally, has the same effect on the body, right? And if you're trying to make the connection with Viagra and the citric oxide, right? So <laughs> just, just roll it around in the old brain pan, <laughs> right? Okay. And then post-facilitation. So in the metabolic post-facilitation, we're going to look at taurine, vitamin C, glutamine, magnesium, and theanine. Now, when we look at these supplements, what post-facilitation typically is, is bringing the, the body back down to a resting state as fast as possible to get the body to recover from the stress that we were under. l is an amazing supplement. People misconnect it typically because it's on, the, like on a monster or it's on a sports supplement energy drink. But it has an incredible ability at creating a health benefit post-workout. People that have issues with heart arrhythmias, Taurine can be a great supplement for that. People that have increased anxiety and nutritional related issues, taurine can do a great job. Vitamin C, the big one we used it for with Judd is the fact that it's an incredible anti-cortisol 
supplement. People don't realize that post-workout vitamin C will actually shift your cortisol testosterone ratio. When you look at testosterone and cortisol, they're a teeter-totter, they're inverse to each other. When cortisol's up for a long period of time, stress, all those negative functions, testosterone tanks. So that's why highly stressed, typically men, as they age in the go-getter world of Wall Street, as an example, that their testosterone's garbage, right? Now you can look at uh, post-traumatic stress, but that's usually uh, a combination of TBI as well as elevated cortisol for too long. But if someone hasn't had a history of head injuries and they're having horrible testosterone issues, it's because their cortisol has been so high for so long. Now when you look at that, vitamin C post-workout can quickly shift the access. So if you want to get down the road to recovery as fast as possible, vitamin C post-workout. L-glutamine is going to be not only cardioprotective, but really important. It protects the stomach from the stress. L-glutamine is great for stomach health. And a lot of what we're talking about is irrelevant if stomach health is bad. If your stomach is just a chronic issue of IBS and indigestion and all these issues, your ability to produce neurotransmitters goes down dramatically. Neurotransmitters, the vast majority, are being produced through the things we eat and then processing through the lining of the small intestine and a little bit the stomach. Stomach health pre-everything pre to good mental function. They always say, if you want to fix somebody's depression, ask them about their stomach. The stomach is not a byproduct of a stressful life for a lot of people. The inability to deal with stress is a byproduct of an unhealthy stomach. Does that make sense? Okay. Magnesium comes in a lot of different variations now. The nice thing, when I talk with the guys with Thorn, they can break down how all the different magnesiums have different bodily functions. Right, so like if I take magnesium three and eight before bed, it's affecting my brain because it passes the blood-brain barrier really well. Okay, if I'm taking by glycinate, it helps me sleep for the same reason, but it has a bunch of cardioprotective things going on with it. Okay, if I'm taking magnesium tetrate, I know that I'm taking magnesium tetrate for my heart specifically. The side effect of all three of those variations is they're magnesium and they're a little bit good for everything. So you can't go wrong with magnesium, in my opinion, outside of magnesium citrate. Magnesium citrate is to help you go to the bathroom, right? The only reason it's popular is in a lot of other countries, it's the only form that you can get, right? And try to stay away from magnesium salts as a whole, unless you're rubbing it on your skin or soaking it in a bathtub, okay? And then L-theanine, which we often find in tea, both green tea as well as black teas, L-theanine is going to be a precursor, and this is where it gets a little confusing because even though it improves mental clarity and mental function, L-theanine actually stimulates the pineal gland via serotonin to produce melatonin. So when you take, L when you take theanine before bed, it helps stimulate the pineal gland to do its job to help you go to a restful state. Does that make sense? All right, this is one of my favorites. The hamstring muscle. The fibers of the hamstring involved with knee flexion have a higher percentage of fast twitch fiber than that related to the hamstring with hip extension. Okay, it's an old quote. So when you train, train it accordingly. Okay, all right, so let's get into some protocols. Make sure I'm right on time. Perfect. Okay, so if I was to break down some protocols for athletes, when I'm looking at weights and sprints in the AM, CoQ10, creatine, phosphatidylcholine, L-carnitine. Every single day, regardless of whether or not they train, that's what they're doing. The pre-workout is going to be neurospecific. I want that hit of caffeine. I want the acetyl L-carnitine, the tyrosine, and the beta alanine. Now here's an interesting little trick. Put this in your notebook or your, or your brain. Everybody's stomach is a little bit different, so no one can quite figure out how soon or late or close to competition they should take their, their pre-workout. Take beta alanine, 
however you choose to take it. Don't take it in a proprietary blend. Take it by itself. When you consume it, start your clock. When you feel the pins and needles, that's roughly how long it takes your body to metabolize something on an empty stomach. That'll give you a rough window of when you should be taking your supplements prior to competition. So it's like an old like back pocket trick we used to use, right? Some people used to do it with caffeine, but man, everybody's so caffeine dependent now, okay? So use your beta alanine to, to give you an idea. If it's 30 minutes, it's 30 minutes. Intra-workout, electrolytes, essential amino acids, branch chain amino acids, super simple. You can throw in a little bit if your body fat's low, like these guys over here. If your body fat's low, you can throw in a little bit of simple sugar carbohydrate to radically increase the upregulation or the absorption of B, C, A, E, A, A electrolyte, right? Everybody else, you don't really need it, to be honest. Post-workout, protein, simple carbs, vitamin C for cortisol, okay? Taurine, magnesium, theanine, GABA. Now, theanine will also upregulate GABA, and L-arginine is the same as L-arginine, but I spelt it different, <laughs> right? So, now, I'm glad I spelt it different, and I'm going to segue on this point like I own it. That a boy. So, with L-arginine, the reason why it's in here, even though I don't think it's as good of an upregulator of nasitric oxide in terms of creating a vasillation or a pump in an athlete, there's an interesting research study from way back before the internet got ruined. And what this internet study showed is that if you took L-arginine before you trained, your growth hormone would increase 300%, right? Now, the funny thing about that article if you didn't take L-arginine, they didn't talk about this because they were selling it, and did max effort deads, your growth hormone increased 500%. So they were like, it increased 300. It's only 200 less than it would have if you didn't take it. Okay, so L-arginine, <laughs> in terms of a pre-workout supplement, it's not as good as people think for just weight lifting. Now, where it did get interesting, you take L-arginine before you go to bed at night, when you should take it, and it creates the vasodilation and its natural function, and the citric oxide does its job, your growth hormone goes through the roof, roof while you're sleeping. L-arginine should be a pre-bedtime supplement, period. Citrulline, L-citrulline should be your metabolic vasodilation, if you want it, if I was to have to like make a decision, okay? Now, on that caveat, should you take caffeine and L-citrulline, or caffeine, and which we see everywhere, arginine is a pre-workout together. Okay, but no. <laughs> are, you, are you pulling my leg? Okay, yeah. Okay, does anyone else say no or of course? No, yes or no? Take everything. Take everything. Yeah, swim in the kitchen sink. Double down. Double down. Okay, so think of it this way. If you're trying to get as jacked as possible, and we know that hypertrophy or vasodilation triggers the actual growth of a muscle, is caffeine a vasodilator or a vasoconstrictor, right? So if L-arginine or citrulline is a vasodilator, and the supplement you're spending 90 bucks a month to take every single day does the two opposite things, is it worth the money? It's not. Just keep taking more until you totally saturate the cells, right? So what I always tell people is choose your weapon. If you're a neurologically driven athlete and neurological performance and maximal strength is all you care about, then caffeine is the driving force supplement in that scenario. If you're an athlete that is trying to be as jacked as possible and you can't motivate without caffeine, that's a problem because you need to be able to vasodilate to grow the most. So you need to take a step back and reconsider your lifestyle choices, right? And that's just reality of that situation, okay? So Judd has one of my favorite quotes all time from the days I played sports under Judd is, it's better to have complete faith in an average program than no faith in a perfect one, right? And that goes a long ways for a lot of coaches. Always keep that in mind. It is better to motivate an athlete to maximum performance even if you don't know everything, then to have them not believe anything you say, right? Always keep that in mind. 
as an athlete and as a coach. All right, metabolic duration. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's like a derivative of caffeine as well as citrulline. Yeah, so the thing I like about L-citrulline, and the question is, is guarana is a variation that can be a stimulant like caffeine, and L-citrulline, which is an acitric oxide upregulator, the thing that makes citrulline a bit of a better option is it scavenges the citric oxide from the system that already exists. And so it creates a relaxation and a vasodilation, but it's not competing with the caffeine itself to do it. It's a more natural variation of something that already exists, if that makes sense. Yeah, 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 it's uh, 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 3.5 grams of citrulline per kilogram of watermelon, so something like this, right? Yeah, absolutely, it all works, right? It's a little bit of a pain regulator, all right? So go ahead and take a photo, write this down. A lot of these are just so you can take them, okay? Nothing here is changing other than the resistant starch. Anyone know what a resistant starch is, reactive starch? Anyone know what the supplement UCAN is? Okay, so UCAN was created to deal with glu uh, glucose disease in the, in the founder's uh, child. But if you want to make easy uh, reactive or resistant starch, and basically what that means is your carbohydrate will digest slower and won't cause this radical spike of your insulin, make mashed potatoes, put them in the fridge overnight. When you eat the mashed potato cold then rewarmed, you have created a natural reactive or resistant starch. It'll be a slow digesting carbohydrate. And it'll go through the system a much more gradual and manageable pace. You won't get a big crash and you won't get a big spike. So if you like mashed potatoes and you're trying to lose weight, never eat them hot. Always eat them the next day. Stay a day ahead and you'll create a reactive starch, okay? real potatoes. You know what I'm saying? With butter? Yep, and the other one, reactive, uh, yeah, and white rice is the other. So they use corn maize to create you can, white rice and white potato, you can make your own reactive starches out of, but you have to cook and cool. Same with the rice? Yeah, so cook and cool. Yep. Yeah. Changes how the, uh, the carbohydrate breaks down and it makes it more literally resistant to your body's ability to digest it. Yeah. 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 Yep. And the sugars itself changes. Yep. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. If I was stuck on an island with only one barbell and I could only do one exercise with that barbell, it would be the snatch grip deadlift. Okay. Another one of my favorite quotes. And in the pandemic times, I put that to the test more times than I would like to admit in a space between me and you. Right? But you make the best of it. All right, and the last protocol that we're going to look at is one that I think can be really beneficial somewhat to our, our tactical people and some to athletes, and that is just kind of a, a throw it in there altitude protocol that I used with Kai Ferro before she went on the last man out in the UK, and we had to come up with a solution to deal with the stresses of immediate high altitude at 16,000 feet so she could be on a TV show. And so what I came up with is 14 days before going to altitude, we used CoQ10, Altorine, Glutamine, Arginine, Ginkgo to increase the body's ability to tolerate the stress. Ginkgo pilova has always been used for altitude with cultures that had access to it because of the increase of blood flow cerebrally and the ability to deal with the hypoxic nature of altitude and decrease in brain function. Glutamine for Altitude bubble guts. Anybody that's had to go up to altitude or had to compete at altitude, and remember, depending on who you are, altitude is going up to Boulder, Colorado at 5,700 feet from sea level. That's altitude for a lot of athletes. It happens quick. You know, you see it at uh, Colorado Springs, right? You're about 8,000-ish feet at the high points. 
Yeah, you know, so bubble guts happens to athletes. L-glutamine will help basically balance out that system and prevent that sensation, okay? Taurine improves heart rhythm. I don't care what athlete it is, I don't care who they are. If you have an athlete that you want to improve the energy system of the heart, taurine. Dr. Serrano, who was here two years ago, was once quoted on a video from probably six to eight years ago, and Dr. Serrano said, a muscle doesn't grow in a taurine deficiency. Doesn't grow. So he believed that four grams of taurine a day was essential for hypertrophy, okay? Things that are high in taurine, shellfish, right? But it's a cheap supplement, and it's good for the heart. Arginine for vasodilation, we use this instead of citrulline. You betcha. Uh, Derek put me on this table. Oh, that's right. From where we're at right now, which is 425, yeah. or 475. So I trained here, and I went up there. I went up there, I was on that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, crushed it. Crushed it. So, And it's a big savior. Like with Kai Faro, when she went up to 16,000 feet for Last Man Out, that English show where she goes against the SAS guy and they race, after the fact, she almost beat the host, who's phenomenal shape. Yeah, impressive. impressive. And, she, and she almost beat him. They actually made it so she couldn't. So there's an argument to be made that she might have been on the Last Man Out, very first female competitor might have took him down. And she said that she had very little to no issue. Now, she was at 16,000. We're going to look at 8,000 at the, what, 8,000 8, is altitude. Everything else below that is a variation. 8,000 is kind of our ceiling where when you hit 8,000 above, you're now considered high altitude training, okay? And so when we see that, we got ginkgo, beetroot has now been thrown in, and Advil, which I'll just kind of drift over. It's because the headaches are so bad, there is a benefit to taking Advil to improve cerebral health at altitude, if someone is okay to take Advil, okay? So that's why it's in there. It's been a proven method to deal with expeditions. Caffeine is my preferred method. Caffeine, even though it's a vasoconstrictor, has the ability to make someone more discomfort tolerable in those scenarios. Caffeine at altitude will improve the way you feel, Ginkgo improves blood flow to the brain so that your cognition doesn't get disrupted. Beetroot was the one, the other one that I gave Bert. Beetroot is a vasodilator, but it's a natural vasodilator. And it's very easy on the body. And so what we would typically do is use beetroot drink solution and add the other supplements to it. And it's really good for the heart. The Q10 and the taurine Again, it's heart protective. Because what is the thing that happens at altitude? The heart has to speed up to oxygenate the body until the gas exchange in the lungs and body balances out and you can tolerate altitude. So you may be in tremendous shape, but your resting heart rate goes from 52 to 72 at 8,000 feet, and that's just the way it is until you regulate. That's a lot more beats a day than your body's used to making, and because of that, mitochondria energy production goes through the roof, and you use simply more things to do your day. Does that make sense? Okay, it's very simple, physiology. Okay? And this is my favorite, and I'm making an homage to Paula Quinn because we lost him a couple years ago, and I was talking to Bert about this, but he said, insulin is the easiest hormone to... Hormone, hormone. <laughs> That guy's a hormon. Uh, so is, he, is, he, uh, is the easiest hormone to control in a healthy population, unlike stress. And then he would go on to say, because I've never seen a donut that attacked anyone, right? It's a self-induced, it's a self-induced, okay? And then the last one we're gonna look at is zinc, magnesium, topical, and related to sleep stress or sleep hygiene. So when we break down zinc, we know that zinc is going to be, bless you, is going to be a driving force for hormone production, okay? Testosterone is going to benefit from the consumption of zinc. Zinc, when taken with, and I know a lot of you guys are podcast people, if you heard the statement, an ionophore, 
its ability to deal with things that are really hard on our DNA, like, I don't know, COVID improves, okay? So an ionophore would be like turmeric. So whenever I talk about zinc, I always tell people, if you're taking zinc, take curcumin or turmeric. It allows it to be digested. Zinc doesn't actually get into the cell very well. A lot of people don't think about it, but it's just a reality. So if you can improve the carrier, which, you know, think of it this way, what would be an ionophore? Hydroxychloroquine, woo right? So that's all that was happening there, is when they gave it with zinc, it, it got the zinc into a cell of an unhealthy person, and it's really good at killing things that attack our RNA and DNA. So zinc's great for that, increasing testosterone. Magnesium, I write topical because I'm a big believer that you can only consume so much magnesium before you crap your pants. That's just a fact, right? <laughs> yes. Right? We're talking about consumptions, right? So that's going to be a side effect if it goes sour, and it does for a lot of people. So if you have someone that's magnesium deficient, we know that magnesium affects 300 bodily functions to be optimized, and you can't get enough magnesium into an athlete that's coming off a bad lifestyle because their stomach is so bad from all the food they were consuming. The only way to get it balanced is topical. Put it through the skin. Rub it on the feet, rub it on the skin, Topical variations of magnesium can be a little more stomach harsh. So you'll see like a magnesium sulfate or a magnesium citrate that is topical, and that's fine. GABA, right? GABA, which is going to help as well with the melatonin. It's going to help produce through a serotonin pathway for the body to downregulate. Some people will have issues with GABA when they're deficient. So think, think like dopamine. GABA's over here. Dopamine gets you going, GABA brings you down. Some people will have issues with GABA in the beginning. If they're very deficient, they'll have terrible dreams and restless sleep. So you have to sometimes work them into it a little bit slower, okay? So be aware of that. It could be the very thing that's supposed to make you sleep that's keeping you awake. Taurine for heart rhythm, L-theanine for its ability to stimulate serotonin through the pineal gland, which results in melatonin production, okay? That's why tea before bed has always been a natural remedy for so many people. It's very high in L-theanine, okay? Now, I know that the schedule is a little bit off, so let me just double check so I'm not running into some fantastic carryover time. So we have about five minutes of question time left, and I'll start right here. Yeah. Well, I, I think there's actually a, a good argument to be made with post-workout caffeine consumption because post-workout caffeine consum consumption, the same reason it helps to balance out cortisol levels, like caffeine is also really good at being able to attenuate cor cortisol. It also will help bring it back down as well. Now, the problem with caffeine post-workout is it's still stimulatory. Right, so the argument I'd be made is even though it's going to be a pain reliever potentially, potentially, a pain reliever for some as well as something that creates a slight euphoria or recovery sensation, you still are going to have a supplement that is going to keep someone more sympathetic than parasympathetic. And what we want to do post-workout is to get the body into a rest digest state as fast as possible so that we can maximize the upregulation of nutrient through consumption of food to get hypertrophy or recovery to occur. And in my opinion, anything that slows that process in that initial window is going to deregulate the body's ability to recover. So, you, so, so I wouldn't do it personally, yeah. but... Just to me, I mean, I felt like the cons outweigh the... Yeah, I think the cons outweigh it too. I think that's why if you're trying to get as jacked as possible, caffeine post-workout's a waste of time. The desire to be jacked should be the motivation because you need to use supplements that have to make you swell as much as possible to get the gene to trigger to create the hypertrophy. And so if you're shutting down the trigger for the gene to, to grow for any reason, your hypertrophy just takes longer, right? That is, thank you. You bet. Oh, we've got a couple back here. Go. Go. go ahead and pass it back. 
Uh, how much do you think the uh, strength and sprint protocol can happen with college athletes, like with the supplement, with all the tough regulations and stuff like that? You want my honest opinion that Ab- I don't coach anymore? Absolutely. You have a conversation with the athlete. If you're not their coach or if you're the athlete and you make conscious personal decisions that you keep to yourself, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. It's, you know, keep it, keep it internal. You know that nothing you're taking is breaking any rules. The problem is, is there is no way you can get the nutritional volume to elicit the athletic change. You would have to eat to get creatine. If you wanted to get enough creatine to elicit that change, the number was five to seven pounds of red meat. Which college athlete can afford that? I couldn't. Can digest it. Well, I could digest it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. 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 But that, and that's the truth. You do your research and make the honest choice for yourself and stay away from brands that cross-label with things that can be tested positive in the factory setting. So, I mean, not because they're sitting here or have a trailer outside, but there is an absolute reason why you use a company that does NSF or produces their own product. The reason being is because you know that even if they're making something that doesn't fall under the guideline, their vats, their giant manufacturing systems, aren't producing some hot product for a bodybuilding company that accidentally tainted yours. So that's why I direct people to clean products, because they will still potentially be producing a supplement that maybe you shouldn't take, right? But because they're not making anything you really shouldn't take, you'll never test positive. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Question? Thoughts on nicotine? Nah, I'm not a fan, but I'll talk about it. So nicotine is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm not a. <laughs> so nicotine. I mean, nicotine patch, nicotine gum for someone that's a non-smoker radi- radically increases metabolism and it radically increases the rate in which you're able to burn body fat. It's the reason why smokers aren't losing weight just because of the oral fixation of smoking. The actual nicotine is a strong enough stimulant that it causes body fat to burn. So that being said, figure and bodybuilding athletes getting ready for shows notoriously chew a boatload of nicotine gum because it helps them burn a ton of body fat. Yeah. Oh yeah, go for it. So when you look at nicotine for nootropic effects, you're looking for something that gives you the false state of euphoria. Now, with that being said, you could make the argument that chewing nicotine gum for endurance-based athletes could get them through the hurdle of psychological breakdown. That's a fair argument to make. I just don't know if it outweighs any performance negative. So, like... like the guys that even chewed coca leaves and worked at altitude. Anything that increases a euphoric nature in the athlete is going to make a hard life easier. And that's a fair argument that you have to leave up to the user. So if the end user needs to consume something to get through the hardship of the situation, who am I to say it's right or wrong? Yeah, good luck, right? If it, uh, if it diminishes performance, that is also on you. Yep. And one more back here. Right off the top of my head? Uh, Not online, but if I had to throw out a top three, I'll give you Cadillac. Let's do it this way. I'll give you Ford. Okay, I'll give you Ford, Ferrari, and uh, McLaren. Okay? If I'm dealing with an athlete that I want to take a really pure supplement, but they have a Ford Focus budget, it's going to be Solar Ray, right? You can't go wrong. It's not going to hurt you. You're never going to get banged up from taking Solar Ray, right? If I then had a little bit more income and I wanted to take something that was a little pure, a little more tested, a little more something or other, you know, you can start to look at things like now nutrition, designs for health, getting into that more medical grade. And no blowing smoke. 
If you want McLaren, it's going to be Thorn Nutrition. They're right here in South Carolina. They are, and I don't use just Thorn. I'll be the first to admit it, but my most important supplements are because I need to know what's in that capsule, right? And so if you're on a budget, Solaroy is good. Go ahead. What's that? No, I missed something? Hmm. And one last. Not anymore, right? The, the research is too all over the road. It used to be really cut and dry to be able to, per, to predict it, but we're finding that athletes, due to so many metabolic disturbances, a dose for a big athlete is no longer the same for a small. Caffeine is a good example. Based on heritage and genetic trait, you could test for a certain genetic metabolite a bit, or the ability to metabolize caffeine. And even though the guy's 6'6", 250 pounds, they metabolize the same way that a female athlete is that's half their size. So you can, there's generalities, but for the most part, not anymore. I have to look at what the athlete's stomach health is and what their lifestyle is. I mean, if they're drinking, smoking, and eating shit all the time, the supplement consumption is going to be way different, right? They may need more because their stomach's a disaster. All right, guys and girls, I thank you. That's it. Trust <laughs>